Welcome to Roll Call, a 126th Air Refueling Wing podcast of the Illinois Air National Guard at Scott Air Force Base. I'm your host, Technical Sergeant Brian Ellison. The Roll Call podcast focuses on people, mission, and community. I want to say hello to all our friends who are deployed. Thanks for listening to the podcast. According to Assistant Secretary of Defense for Health Affairs, Thomas McCaffrey, DOD is expected to receive its first allotment of COVID-19 vaccines in the coming weeks. The first allotment is a limited quantity of vaccine. The first allotment is to prioritize for health care providers, followed by DOD long-term care facilities, high-risk populations, those in critical national capability positions, and finally, healthy populations. The vaccine is delivered in a two-shot series. The vaccine is voluntary for military personnel as it becomes available, but could be mandatory once the vaccine receives FDA final approval. I can't wait to get mine. It's something about just that peace of mind of knowing that I've got my, I've got my, uh, COVID shot, and uh, maybe I can rest a little bit easier. Coming this weekend during December Drill 2020 2.0, Airmen and Family Readiness has their Holiday Bazaar each day this weekend from 11 to 2 in uh, Building uh, 5046, that's uh, cold storage. Airmen and Family Readiness still has a couple food baskets, live Christmas trees, and plenty of stocking stuffers available. Special requests such as uh, delivery for trees, uh, deliveries of toys can be made in advance. For more information, you can call Airmen and Family Readiness, 618-222-5784. Congratulations to the Wings Outstanding Airmen of the Year for 2021. Airmen of the Year, Senior Airman Cole Gelfius, 126th Operations Group, NCO of the Year, Staff Sergeant Mariah Nelson, 126th Med Group. Senior NCO of the Year, Master Sergeant Brian Hatfield. We'll talk to him in just a few minutes. He's from the 126th uh, Headquarters. First Sergeant of the Year, Senior Master Sergeant Nicole Peterson of the uh, 126th uh, Mission Support Group. They move on to represent our wing at the state level. Uh, competition during the January UTA at Camp Lincoln in Springfield. Well, again, like I said, we'll be talking to uh, Master Sergeant Brian Hatfield, the uh, senior NCO of the year, coming up in just a few minutes. The combined federal campaign is going on now through January 15th. CFC is the world's largest and most successful annual workplace charity campaign with almost 200 CFC campaigns throughout the country and overseas raising millions of dollars uh, each year. Pledges made by federal, civilian, postal, and military donors during the uh, campaign season will support eligible nonprofit organizations that provide health and human service benefits throughout the world. Think about it. For most of us, home is more than four walls and a roof. It's a place of our own where we feel safe. But so many people around the globe have to find a way to live without the comfort of a place to call home. Over half a million people are homeless on a single night in the U.S. Of those, 65% find refuge in a shelter, while the other 35%, just under 200,000 people, go unsheltered on our streets, battling the elements, searching for food, and going days, sometimes weeks, without a shower or adequate hygiene. This this contributes to many preventable diseases and, and injuries. One of the uh, primary reasons for homelessness around the world is unexpected displacement due to conflict or disasters. Affected individuals, families, and communities are typically left with little to no resources. There are many CFC charities helping people who find these homeless, who find themselves homeless right now. Here in our own community and around the world, these charities provide immediate relief in the form of a clean bed, hot meal, or shower, but also provide longer-term hope and solutions through training on uh, life skills needed to get back on their feet. So go to uh, your go to CFC. 
uh, the combined federal charities. And uh, if you want to help a cause like a help fighting homelessness, you can certainly do that. Hi, we are the 126 recruiting team. I'm Master Sergeant Heather Wildey, recruiting flight chief. I'm Technical Sergeant Richard Olson, production recruiter. To learn more about career training with the 126, give us a call at 618-222-5701. But, but wait, wait, there's, there's more. more. Give us a call in the next five minutes and you could qualify for four years of free college tuition. Welcome to the Roll Call Podcast, the Outstanding Airman of the Year in the Senior NCO category, Master Sergeant Brian Hatfield. Again, thanks for uh, coming on the podcast, sir. Thanks right. for having me. Outstanding Airman of the Year. What led you to uh, being nominated for this? From the Oh, we should say you're from the command post. Yes, I am from the command post. Uh, I guess I would say the uh, biggest reason why I got nominated is because uh, Chief Johnson nominated me for... Uh, for the category, um, then I would say, uh, but she nominated me, I would like to think, due to my work ethic, um, everything, all the responsibilities that I've taken on, my involvement that I've uh, had within the wing outside of my uh, command post duties. What involvements have you had outside the wing? Uh, when COVID started, uh, I helped my mother-in-law make a bunch of masks, and we distributed those out um, way back in March and April of this year. Um, gotten more involved. While they didn't have it this year, uh, last year is involved in the uh, Kids on Guard. Um, Colonel Jackson earlier this year asked for a uh, commemorative uh, 126 or refueling wing coin be made for all the stuff we've done this year, the COVID, DISCA, uh, uh, possible flood duties. So myself and uh, Sergeant Freeman from uh, the GLSC, I want to say. Okay. Uh, we, we both uh, volunteered for that. So we designed the commemorative coin for the wing this year. Yeah, I saw that coin. It's got the COVID, uh, the COVID whatever you, virus on it. Yeah, that's yeah. a great. If you haven't seen that coin, I didn't know that you. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's know. actually a. Um, I guess you could say maybe a lot of, not really hidden meanings, but there's a lot of more than just the what's on the surface to it. Obviously, on the front you have the, uh, the guard, the guardsmen uh, standing in front of the state of Illinois as you know, hey, we're defending our state. Uh, we also added a mask. To the guardsmen as uh, part of the COVID thing. Oh, I didn't see that. Yeah. Uh, on the If you're looking at the coin on the left-hand side, obviously you have the coronavirus uh, thing. On the right-hand side, there's a, uh, a riot shield and a riot helmet to represent what the security forces did with uh, civil support. On the bottom, there was uh, water, which was initially we thought we were going to get tagged for flood duty. But with the base flooding in 2020, it <laughs> rounded up very apropos. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. And then uh, on the back, obviously, that represents more of our global commitment and our worldwide defense of the nation. And uh, I didn't intend it, but it was pointed out to me that the nose of the 135 actually points towards uh, Poland oh. so, as our state partner. So that's sort of just dumb, dumb luck with that design, I guess. <laughs> A great Easter eggs. Yeah, yeah. That's awesome. And how, how did that collaboration go with the, uh, I didn't catch his name. Sergeant Freeman. Sergeant Freeman, how'd mm -hmm. that collaboration go? We basically, uh, we had a meeting with uh, Colonel Babiak. Uh, we had both drawn up some ideas as to what we thought it should look like. He gave us some inputs, and then it was uh, very much a back and forth. Uh, as, hey, hear what we think. We'd get his feedback, Colonel Jackson's feedback. We'd incorporate what they wanted. Um, I want to say the whole process probably took about three weeks maybe to, to get the, the finalized of the design, but it was pretty painless. Uh, they, they pretty much... Uh, Colonel Jackson pretty much trusted us to get the right thing. There were just certain things that he wanted in there, which we obviously were able to incorporate really easily. That's uh, that's that's really cool. Yeah, if you haven't seen that uh, coin, I'm sure some friends of yours have uh, received the coins. For those that are listening, and uh, maybe we should get – do you have a copy of that that we could put on the Facebook page or out there on Instagram and social network? I don't have mine on me because it's in my, sure. my stash at home, but right. uh, they are uh, – I want to say they, they're probably listed on – there's probably pictures of it on our on our wing page. Okay. Um, I know that uh, one of my guys I work with, Sergeant Reeves, and I posted that I got lucky and got coined four times this weekend. I posted all the coins, so there are pictures of them floating out there. You got four coins. I did. Wow, that's like yeah. uh, I don't know. That's like a grand. Slam. I mean, it is a grand slam. Yeah. That's pretty awesome. Never Which, happened before. Yeah, that's probably uh, never happened again. <laughs> <laughs> it's a rarity. Yeah. What uh, what'd you get coins for this weekend? Uh. Colonel Jackson coined me for, uh, with the uh, commemorative coin, obviously for all the stuff that Command Post did with uh, coronavirus, the taskings. I mean, it was it was interesting to say the least uh, with that. 
and then he uh, he coined me the commander's coin. Um, I believe that was for winning OAY. Oh yeah, sure. And then uh, Chief Douglas coined me uh, just for making uh, for making it to the board. Oh, that's cool. He coined. I believe he coined everybody on their way out of the board. And then uh, General Nazamas coined me also. You got a coin from General Nazamas? I did. I haven't got a coin from him, but you know I should get a coin for driving with him. Yeah. That man is. Uh, He's a madman when he drives. I've known General Nazamas, I believe, since he was a major. Oh, wow. Yeah. Oh, you know, I was looking at the uh, the old uh, yearbook. I think from the twenty from two thousand. I think there's a nice uh, there's a nice picture of General Nazamas uh, as I guess Colonel with a, a nice stash. Yeah, think, Lieutenant Colonel. Sir, similar to my uh, stash, which I grew for November. Yeah. And uh, I was going to shave it off, and my wife and daughter were like, "No, keep it." I'm like. I'm growing one for March. For March? What's March? Mustache March. Oh, Mustache, mustache March. March. So I should probably just yeah. keep growing mine out. Yeah. I don't yeah. know. One of the guys thrown down the gauntlet, so I was like, okay, challenge accepted. <laughs> so uh, we're here with Master Sergeant Brian Hatfield from, from the command post. He is the uh, senior NCO winner of the Outstanding Airman of the Year. What was that process like for you to go through... Uh, just being at that board, because board. I mean, what, was it nerve wracking for you? What did you have to study? What 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 goes into that preparation? Um, there's really, since you don't know what questions they're going to ask you, it's it's really difficult to study. You sort of ask your your supervisors or or anybody you can get a hold of. Hey, do you have any advice on this? And uh, you know, but you, you sort of think that you know, what could they ask you about? Do they ask you about you know, what do you feel your roles are as whatever category you're nominated for? You know, what, what do you like? What don't you like about the Air Force? There's just, there's so much that they could ask and you don't know. Um, the biggest thing is be confident, but don't be arrogant. And go in there with poise, know what you're going to say. And if they ask you a question that you don't know, take a breath. It's okay to wait a second or two before you give them an answer. And the other thing I've discovered is if it's a multi-part question, two or three parts, and you only answer one part and you forget the other two, it's okay to re-attack and ask them, you know, hey, did I answer your question fully? All that. And then something that I've always gotten in the habit of is, is at the end, always thank board members for their time because um, they're volunteers that are doing this. And the other thing is always ask, did I answer all your questions clearly and concisely? Is there any other, is there any other information that, that, that I need to give you to answer your questions? That's a great idea. You've been through uh, many boards, I take it. Surprisingly not, no. Oh, no, really? But I have helped prep people for boards. Oh, okay. So, uh, yeah, actually, in all honesty, this was the, uh, the OAY board was the first one I've been through on the receiving end uh, since my master sergeant board. Wow. But I have helped prepare a few people. Reports. So. That's uh, awesome. What was uh, something that maybe while you were in there that uh, tripped you up? Or maybe not tripped you up, but yeah, I, I mean, I'm sure there's always that question that someone throws at you. You're like, okay, that's a weird one. Yeah, um, there was one about, it was, it was a two-parter of what, what do you like about your job and what don't you like about your job? And there's always things that there's always things that you don't like about your job, but you got to make, in my opinion, you have to make sure that you're not coming off as negative or complaining about your duties. Sure. So, yeah, it can be an issue, but you don't want to delve into, you don't want to dive into the rabbit rabbit hole of, of, of negativity, especially during a board. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Did you bring up the Air Force uh, dress uniform? I did not. I did. That was not a question posed to me, and I did not bring that issue up. <laughs> We were just talking uh, off air about the uh, just the uniform, and boy, that uniform could use a little update, especially with those pants. I struggle with my uh, pants. Um, what tip? Uh, wait, I think you talked about it, but what tips uh, do you think? I think we just we just talked about tips, but any other tips that you can think of uh, going into the board or preparing for the board uh, that uh, would help somebody out? Um. Yeah, and actually, I mean, it sounds obvious, and it not always is. Um, check your uniform over, and then check it again, and then check it one more time. And even if you think you got it right, 
have your supervisor check it, have one of your subordinates check it, have a coworker check it. Um, it's, it's little things um, that can trip you up. Um, there was one, one time I've seen when we, we called it, and no big deal, but um, an individual had the, uh, the mess dress command badge on, which oh. is smaller than the normal command badge, just by mistake, no issue. But we you know, called it before they went over, called it before uh, they had a... And, no problem. There. Yeah, I wouldn't even thought about that, but yeah, that makes always, sense. The, the, that's the, the thing that is the easiest thing to fix is make sure your uniform is correct. Make sure your ribbons are correct. Make sure you got the right number of devices. Make sure that they're placed where they need to be. That's Are they checking that when they, they go? Are they checking the order that, I mean, they're glancing them. They're probably I, not I believe I believe the board members have a rip. Right. They have your virtual MPF rip, so they're going to know what ribbons you have. Okay. Or they should, and then... They didn't obviously uh, go up there with a, a ruler sure. and, and measure, but if your ribbons aren't in the correct order, you're missing some. You're gonna, they're going to be able to identify that pretty quickly. <laughs> <laughs> what can someone do to be nominated? I mean, I know, I know, you don't go up and ask your supervisor, "Hey, I want to be nominated," but maybe that's a, that's a, a goal for somebody. Mm-hmm. What can I mean? What can someone do, or uh, maybe, but but really being OAY is also, I mean, it's just maybe paying more, t- being more uh, thoughtful about what you do to get promoted. Right. Um, well, the first thing obviously is be good at your job. Right. That's that's the most obvious thing. But then uh, beyond that, no matter what rank you are, whether you're an airman, staff, tech, master. Um, you need to be preparing to do the job of your supervisor. Now, obviously, you're not trying to push them out of the way or anything, right? but you need to show the initiative of, hey, I am trying to take more responsibility beyond what my current role is to show not only your direct supervisor, but also whether it's your group leadership or wing leadership that, hey, I am, I am preparing myself for when, for when or if this person retires or leaves that I will be ready to step in if, if they choose you. Um, the other thing is, and when I was a young, young staff, a young airman, I didn't listen to the guys that were in my position. But get your PME done. And when when it's when you can do it, get it done and knock it out. That is a huge issue because you don't want to be you you, you don't want to be the person where your commander says comes to your supervisor and says, "Hey, I'm ready. Pr- I'm ready to promote this individual." Are, are they promotion eligible? And then your supervisor turns around and says, no, sir, they don't have their PME done. Or if you're, if you're trying to make senior or chief, no, they don't have their CCAF done. Remove every roadblock you can possibly, possibly remove by yourself so that, so that you're not inhibiting your, your, your career progression wherever you want your career to go. And then the other thing is be involved in wing activities or community activities outside of the purview of your actual military duties. Um, Because they do look at that. I mean, we're always told they want the well-rounded airmen. They don't want, they're not going to nominate a person. They're not going to select a winner uh, for somebody who, and I I hate, I don't mean to be negative, that just comes in and does their job. I mean, there's some people that that's what they want. They want to come in and do their job, and that's it. But for those that do want to progress, you've got to, you just have to accept that you're going to have to do certain things outside your actual military purview. And being in the Guard, I would say, you know, doing things for the community isn't really outside of our purview. It's just outside of your actual job duties. Right. What, uh, what you mentioned the masks. What else uh, have you done outside uh, in the community? Uh, well, like I say, um, this year I made, uh, when, when COVID first started getting bad in March and April, um, my mother-in-law was, uh, she was making masks for people. So while I'm no seamstress by any stretch of the imagination, <laughs> I can, I was at least able to go over there, uh, you know, cut the mask, cut the material to the correct size, uh, measure it, fold it, iron it, um, and, you know, hand them out, um, to people that needed them. Uh, the other thing I did is, uh, my nephew, he is, uh, plays on a select baseball team oh, and nice. they're actually they're, they are really good the team as a whole they've yeah. won they won the state of indiana like two years in a row oh wow so um anybody from that team that will send me video footage okay even though my editing equipment is rudimentary at best sure i, I do I, I make a an end of, an end of year review video for their little league team oh that's awesome so i've done that and then uh obviously the uh the aforementioned coin 
Yeah. Um, and yeah. even though it's with inside the unit, um, you know, any, I mean, whatever you can do to volunteer, like right. if, you know, organizing promotion ceremony for your, for your supervisor or for a subordinate, you know, some people don't want that recognition. Some people enjoy that recognition, even though they won't admit it. <laughs> <laughs> I might be the one that doesn't want to admit it. Um, and you mentioned the, uh, what's that, the summer program. What was that? Oh, the Kids on Guard program? Yeah, the Kids on Guard. Yeah, unfortunately, with uh, the pandemic, that didn't happen this year. Right. But, uh, yeah, norm- I mean, it had happened in all years prior. Mr. Barker uh, organizes that. And it's basically, you bring your kids out. Um, I brought my grandkids out last year. Wait, I, grandkids? I, yeah, I do. I, I have grandkids. I have uh, I have four grandkids, and I got one. There's one more on the way. Wow. So I would have guessed you're that old. I mean, I, I say however you want to, however yeah. you want. My say wife that. was married before. Oh, okay. So okay. there, I have three stepchildren, although they're my kids because I've sure. been there with them for twenty years, and then my grandkids. But yeah, so I have. Uh, okay. But uh, yeah, the kids on guard program. You know, um, it's all ages basically. You bring them out. You know, you know they go around to different agencies. You know, they get to see maintenance go up in the. Go, you know, they get to go inside of one thirty five. You know, security forces lets them. Um, you know, security forces will put on the, uh, the attack pads or whatever and let them, let the kids beat them down with, uh, <laughs> uh, foam or rubber, uh, rubber batons, um, go around to different agencies, go to, uh, life support. They had a, they had a lifeboat set up and the, the kids oddly enjoyed that one. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, what's your role in that? Uh, basically, I guess like a troop leader, a pack leader. Oh, okay. Uh, just basically making sure that none of them get lost, <laughs> more or less. <laughs> keeping them safe, keeping an eye on them. And there's there's like three, four, five pack leaders for each age group kind of thing. Oh, okay. So, yeah, we take them around and sort of just, it's like herding cats. Yeah, sure. Yeah. I'm, I'm sure it is, yeah. Um, what, what You were mentioned the masks. Who would you guys give them out to? Were you the, for um, the wing? Basically, um, well, wing had pretty much um, – I think I believe like CE or somebody was already handing out. Um, oh, okay. But this was uh, people that uh, my 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 stepdaughter worked with, or people that my uh, my sister in law worked with. We'd make them, hand them out. I mean, there was one lady that we made a hundred masks for. Wow. We gave they, we gave her a hundred masks. So it was basically just anybody who needed them because at the time, good luck going to Walmart or Lowe's and finding even you know the mask we have now. Oh and, yeah, and sure. They, yeah, they were behind the curve, so yeah. Um, so you work in the command post, uh, Sergeant Hatfield. Uh, what what does the command post do? Um, we, I like to describe it to anybody who's not in the military is we are a mix between FEMA and air traffic control. So we are em, our actual community college of the Air Force degree is in emergency management, um, and we track aircraft but we don't track them on radar. Like we're not air traffic control. We're not vectoring them and directing them what to do. Um, that is probably the most layman version I can give. Um, realistically, we are the, the well, at, right now we are the sole 24 seven operations within the wing. We're here seven, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, every day of the year, rain, snow, sleet, it does not matter. There is somebody in the command post there. We're the eyes and ears for the commander. Um, and we are the only, I, I, I believe I can say we're the only enlisted people in this wing that report directly to the commander. There is no buffer between Chief Johnson and Colonel Jackson. Um, we, we track aircraft. Uh, we process messages from higher headquarters. We up-channel messages through higher headquarters. A lot of information uh, intake and dissemination. Obviously, we have all the secure, you know, secure communications, comply with all higher headquarters requirements. Obviously, as a, uh, as a as a unit with a nuclear mission, we have even more requirements on the command post than what um, a conventional command post like the 375th does. Oh, really? Mm-hmm. Our our training was probably, I would say, conservatively, we have to. Our training is 50 percent more, or it's it's twice what a normal command post is. So what's your what's the AFC for that? It's uh, one Charlie three X one. Okay, uh, and does that need uh, what do you guys need a security clearance? Yes. Uh, so to work in command post, you have a top secret clearance, and then you get uh, you get special identifiers for being for being nuclear certified. We get SDAT pay, which is basically says, hey, 
you're 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 a nuclear certified controller. Wow, that's a is it an, is it an intense job? It can be. Um, I mean, we can go from nothing going on to a hundred miles an hour in the blink of an eye. Um, like I say. The best example of it, and I know not everybody was here for September 11th, but sure. literally uh, September 11th, it went just from a normal average day. And I remember I had just gotten off night shift and gotten called right back in after two hours to it's 100 miles an hour. It's it's, it's a roller coaster of, of work. It's one minute you got a whole lot of work to do. Next minute, maybe not so much work, work to do. So, um, so it's a lot of... Uh, lot of ups and downs as far as the uh the uh pace of work right. work, work that we have what's your uh memory of uh 9 my memory of 9 is or yeah i worked i'd worked that night shift went home um i'd fallen asleep for about two hours and then uh the superintendent at the time called me and he's like hatfield you need to come back into work and i was like no i don't <laughs> I was like, I just worked a night nice shift. Leave me alone. And uh, he said, no, turn on your TV to see what's happening. We are recalling the whole wing. You have to come back to work. And, uh, yeah, didn't even bother to shave. It was, I was like, oh, I got stuff here to deal with. So I threw my uniform on, started heading to work. My mom called me um, on my way in. And uh, it was uh, – it was – like I said, it was a, it was an interesting day. I've never seen because it, it it was unprecedented. Um, it had never happened before, obviously, right? And, and thankfully, it hasn't happened since. Um, but yeah, it was there was a lot of stuff that well, I can't really delve into the ins and outs sure. of it. Um, but it was a lot of stuff that uh, we'd never seen in command post before and haven't seen since. Wow. What what was the uh, the role of command post in uh, COVID? Uh, as I stated before, uh, command post is the only 24 seven operation in the wing. Um, we were there, um, from the moment it started. Um, again, it was, uh, a lot of information dissemination. A lot of stuff is coming down from state. A lot of stuff is coming down from guard bureau. A lot of stuff is coming down from big air force, mm -hmm. um, as to requirements, reporting requirements, tasking orders. Hey, we need people to you know, go to this spot in Illinois to set something up. We need people to go here. Uh, reporting uh, when people would you know, quarantine, test positive. And that was really um, where, where the guys and gals in the command post, we really, uh, I should say airmen in the command post, we really shot, they, they really shined. Um, a lot of processes that had never been there before were invented on the fly. Um, a lot of checklists were created on the fly, and I'm still amazed um, that for the amount of information that we took in, disseminated, and we're still taking in and disseminating, they haven't dropped the ball on it. Like there was never a, an order, uh, an op award, or a, or a frag award missed that the commander needed their attention of. I mean, they've they've been on the ball the whole time. It's, I mean, yeah, to to talk them up, they. They they definitely earned their their, their pay, <laughs> to say the least. <laughs> Gotta ask, why'd you join the uh, Air National Guard? Uh, it, I was active duty uh, for four and a half years before this. Uh, on the other side of the base at TACC, okay. A six month breakdown in Panama, which the guys like to rib me about because Panama was a fun time. Um, but I came back, uh, and all honesty, I had every intention of staying active duty. And one of the guys I worked with. Uh, for those of you who may remember Dave Borden, who is an officer somewhere now, not, <laughs> not, not in this wing. Um, he came over, we'd worked with, uh, I'd worked with him at TCC and he came over here, uh, six months before my separation, uh, was to take place if I didn't reenlist. And, uh, he told me about the command post over here. Uh, I talked to the, my wife about it. She wasn't real big on the idea of PCSing every three, four years or so. Uh, so I came over here, talked to the superintendent, uh, submitted my package, and uh, yeah, that's uh, that was back in January of uh, 2001. I came over here, so I've been here almost 20 years, and uh, I, 
I, I don't have any regrets about it. I've, uh, I've achieved more in the guard and in this unit than I probably ever would have on active duty. And uh, I think looking back on it, if I'd have known, well, I wouldn't trade my active duty time away. Sure. If I would have understood what the guard was and what the guard did, I would have probably just joined the guard straight out of high school instead of going to active duty. So, so where, are you, where are you from? Originally from uh, Middletown, Ohio, more or less. I would say Trenton, but nobody knows where it is. <laughs> and then uh, when I was uh, five years old, we moved up to uh, Warsaw, Indiana, which is oh, okay. about two and a half hours north of Indy, midway between uh, South Bend and Fort Wayne, more or less. Most people know where South Bend is because yep. of Notre Dame. Um, and then, uh, yeah, like I said, joined, uh, joined a month after graduating from high school. So that was. A, I mean, that's a. I mean, you can't go wrong with that. I mean, it's a good, good career. Good. I mean, I love the guard. Everything that I mean. It has every positive of the Air Force, and no, none of the none of the drawbacks of active duty, in my opinion. <laughs> none of the drawbacks. So, you have an interesting last name, Hatfield. Got to yeah. ask, Hatfield McCoy. Is you you related? I am. Uh, my grandfather on my dad's side did some research, and uh, as far as I know, and I actually did a report on it in middle school, my teacher didn't believe me then. <laughs> um, but, yeah, I believe it's like eight greats, and an uncle was uh, Ants Hatfield. nickname was Devil Ants because evidently he was so mean. But, yeah, that is uh, related. But uh, I guess my branch of the Hatfield tree uh, – when all that started, uh, some of them were like, no, we're not going to do this. So they moved up to, uh, like I say, around Cincinnati, Ohio. So that's sort of the attachment to that. Got out of Dodge. Yeah. <laughs> so to speak. Uh, anything else to add? No. Um, well, Chief would be, uh, I'd be remiss if I didn't plug this for Chief. Uh, we do have two, two open spots in command post. Oh, yeah. I forgot to ask you about two, that. Two uh, staff sergeant spots. Or at least we will shortly. Okay. Um, so anybody who's looking to join the guard, especially if you're an airman on active duty that has a top secret clearance, we would love to have you. Um, and yeah, that's. Uh, yeah, AGR would be. Yeah, AGR. Yep. I mean, not right now. They're 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 technician. It's a technician slot right now, but I believe they will be AGRs soon. What is the uh, requirements for AGR? Don't know. Um, as long matter. as you can pass the ASVAB and get a TS clearance, uh, yeah, you don't. As an AGR, you don't have to have the AFSC. Uh, oh, really? To get hired, you got to be able to obtain it. Oh, okay. Um, as a technician, you already have to have the KSA or the knowledge skill levels. So to an require. A okay, you'd have to have a top secret. Okay. No, not necessarily. If you're going to go AGR, no, the, you don't have to have a top secret. Oh, really? They'll they'll, they'll do an investigation. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right. Which, could take a while. They're so behind. <laughs> yeah. Um, maybe I'll ask this a different question. Uh, maybe not. How has, I mean, I've been asking people this all throughout that's come on the podcast. How has COVID changed maybe, uh, how, how has COVID changed your job? I mean, it really is just more, more of what we already do. Um, it's more reporting, more coordination with commanders, or when they, they stood up the WCC, the Wind Control Center. Um, so it's a lot more coordination, lot a lot of information flow uh, that we need to make sure we disseminate to the appropriate agencies. And obviously, it's 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 up the pace, um, a lot. It's up the tempo, I should say, for what we do on a day to day basis. Oh, uh, one more question, I think. Um, so as, well, I guess it doesn't. Can somebody with your AFSC, can they work, is there a, another place in the guard that they could, another place besides a command post that they could work? Um, if you, I believe if you deploy or go TDY as like an augmentee, like there are certain career fields that we could augment. Um, most obviously, most, the one that comes to my mind the most because we've had two people do it is we've aug aug augmented crew, Crewcom, who does all the secure communications for the air crew, and okay. stuff like that. Um, just because we have the 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 comsec experience, it's not 
pretty easy for us to um, pretty easy for us to grasp. Pretty easy for us to uh, fulfill that requirement. Um, as far as like within this unit, not really. Um, there are like special duty assignments. Like you could go up to guard guard center and work at the guard guard command center, but there's not really there's just not really a good say like oh yeah you know command post could go work in maintenance or sure. go, it's it doesn't really we're very much a, a, a catch all of, of little bits of mini career fields okay all right thank you for uh, joining us master sergeant brian hatfield the outstanding airman of the year in the senior nco uh, in the senior nco category thanks for having me Colonel Jackson, the wing commander, needs our help because he recently took command. He has to conduct a climate assessment of the wing. He's asking all of us to take the climate survey no later than February 21st, 2021. This gives uh, uh, you the opportunity to let the commander know about any work issues that concern you the most. The survey is voluntary. Check your military email to get the link and access code. The climate survey is a resource for uh, us to provide confidential feedback on many of the factors that affect you and our workplace. Colonel Jackson asks us to answer the questions honestly, whether your answer is positive or negative. He only receives information about the unit as a whole. He's not going to be able to see how you or anyone else in uh, our unit answered to any specific question. The survey will help him understand issues airmen of the 126th are facing and plan actions to ensure we are moving in the right direction. The commander will debrief the wing after the survey is complete. He reminds us in uh, a world of surveys, this one is vital and directly impacts you and uh, your teammates in the wing. You can find that link for the climate survey in your military email. Don't forget to check us out on social media, including our YouTube page. Search for 126 ARW Public Affairs to find us there. If you're listening to Roll Call on Facebook, you can also find us on your favorite podcast apps like Apple Music and Spotify. If you want me to highlight something on Roll Call or have an event you want highlighted, send us an email, 126.arw.pa.mm. Dot org at us.af.mil. Thank you for listening to Roll Call, a 126th Air Refueling Wing podcast focused on people, mission, and community. I'm Tech Sergeant Brian Ellison. <laughs>